All right, well, good morning again, church. As Rick said, Josh is out with uh, some kind of nasty bug, so I was uh, on call here, and uh, we'll be delivering this morning's sermon. And uh, if you've been with us for some time, uh, we're kind of in a transition here. We're starting something new today. We've been, for the last number of months, preaching through uh, Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament. We like to bounce back and forth between Old and New Testament. And uh, we, finished, we, finished, uh, we finished that several weeks ago. In the last couple weeks, um, Josh has just been kind of preaching through some, uh, just some sort of one-off, some, some topical things, things that we usually, as a church, don't do a lot of. Um, if, you're, uh, if you call Grace community church home, you know that we primarily do expositional teaching. That is going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book of the Bible. And this morning we are starting a new one. We are starting uh, the book of Ephesians. And uh, this, this sermon is going to look a little bit different. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to do, and actually the thing that's going to take the most time this morning, is we are going to be reading through the entire letter of Ephesians, or the entire book of Ephesians, which is uh, six chapters. Uh, so that is uh, a little bit unusual for us. We usually don't take more than a couple of verses at once, um, and I'm sure that moving forward, uh, as we study Ephesians, you'll find, if you're not familiar with it, that Ephesians is very, uh, very thick and rich and loaded. There's just, there's a ton there. Um, typically, we're probably not going to do more than three or four verses in one setting, just because, again, it's so thick. There's so much there. There's so much to, to dive into. There's so many layers to peel back. Uh, so this morning, uh, before we do that, before we get into any of the, the sort of the nitty-gritty or the details, we're just going to take a look at the book as an overview. We're going to um, kind of take a bird's-eye view at the book of Ephesians. At the book of Ephesians. And uh, I guess with Josh not being here, I'm stealing his thunder a little bit. The last two or three times I've preached, I've preached on themes from Ephesians. So I guess I'm right at home here, but this is, uh, again, Josh not getting a shot at it, but I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll make up for that in the years to come as we, uh, as we continue in this letter. So the, the first thing to consider is, uh, is, as we read this, is just kind of asking and thinking through the question of how do we read letters? Um, so when we, when we study different, different parts of the Bible, um, we take them differently. There, there's different contexts there. There's different genres of books. The library, of course, is not just a singular book, but it is a library made up of a number of different books. And uh, as we get into this, this is a letter or an epistle, these tend to be a little bit easier to apply, a little bit easier to understand, kind of a little bit easier to sort of think of, of how we relate to it. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit different when we're dealing with something like a historical narrative, like uh, something like Ezra, where it's kind of, we, find, we feel, I think, a little bit lost as to uh, how it applies to us or how do we see ourselves in there. And I, I hope that uh, through our time in those books that you have been able to see that, but it's sometimes a little bit more difficult. Uh, again, a book like Ezra's, you know, to a specific, uh, uh, it's a, it's a record of a specific uh, event or a, a time period uh, in history. And uh, again, that's not the case with Ephesians. With Ephesians, this is a letter written to a church, written by the Apostle Paul uh, to the church in Ephesians. Uh, and it's written to the church as a whole, uh, the church as a whole. So there's uh, much of the book that is just addressed generally uh, to, to the entirety of the church. There are other parts that are, uh, he's talking specifically to the men. Uh, there's times he'll talk specifically to the women. There's times he'll talk specifically to uh, the children. Um, so it's, uh, it's important that we, uh, that we go through this and we, we kind of think about these things uh, as we begin to dive into it. Um, but uh, this, this letter, and really just letters in general when we come to them um, in, uh, in the New Testament, is typically, again, it's something that's written to the church. Uh, there are some letters that are written to individuals, individual leaders within the church. Um, this is written to the church as a whole. And uh, generally, the sort of structure uh, that it follows is there is a, there is a greeting at the beginning, uh, there's a greeting, then there is uh, some admonitions or some instructions, some, hey, you guys are doing this really well, K keep doing this, refrain from doing this, that kind of thing. Um, there tends to be sections like that in there. Um, there tends to be uh, correction uh, as needed. Uh, sometimes fairly harsh, sometimes, uh, sometimes not so harsh. Um, and then there's usually some kind of final word, sort of an in-closing, and then there's a wrap-up. Uh, there's a goodbye. Um, and it's, 
this tends to be reasonably easy to, uh, to kind of hear and apply just because it's structured that way. Um, in, in this letter, uh, the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul will uh, give us doctrinal truths and then an application based on that. Okay, here are these things that are true. Now here is how you should think about these things and then here is how you should uh, change or, or redirect how you're living to keep, uh, to keep in sync with that, in step with that. Uh, so again, this is written to a specific church, the church in uh, Ephesus, but it is also God's word to us. Um, though we are not members of this particular church body, this church in Ephesus, uh, it is to us by extension because we are in Christ, because we are uh, a part of the church that God has been building for uh, many, many generations. Uh, so again, we're going to do something a little bit strange, and that is reading this whole, this whole letter. Uh, that's not something that, we, that we'll typically do here, uh, but it's important because this is, uh, this is God's word to us, and because this is also how this was intended to be. Uh, it, it was written as a letter. It wasn't written as a thing where, okay, here's this chapter and, and this verse. Now, the, the chapter and verse uh, divisions were something that were added sort of in the late Middle Ages to the Bible, um, just as a way of sort of keeping tabs on it. Um, but the, the early church wouldn't have had those divisions, those chapter and verse uh, divisions. And, and I think those, though they can be helpful, can also be a little bit distracting. Sometimes chapter and verse uh, divisions can kind of tend to uh, lead to us kind of compartmentalizing a little bit and sort of uh, just sort of adding adding wedges uh, here and there where they weren't really intended to be. So that's one of the reasons why we're going to read through this uh, together is just to see it as a uh, as a whole. Um, we've also talked a lot in recent months about uh, just doing that which we see in Scripture. That is, if we see something that's prescribed, do this or do this in this way, we ought to, as a church, seek to keep in step with that. Uh, and that is uh, that is one of, the, one of the things that we're doing by doing this. If you think of how this letter would have been received uh, in its origin, um, Paul wrote the letter and then had it delivered to the church. The church would have read it as a body. They would have read it together. It wasn't just something that, you know, the, uh, the, the pastor or something sits down and reads uh, just sort of in private. No, he would have read it to the church because this is, uh, this is a letter from God to the church or from God through the Apostle Paul to this particular church. So it would have been something that would have been read through as a whole and then expounded on and explained. And we want to uh, keep in sync with, uh, with that. So let me encourage you to, uh, as we are spending, again, I anticipate it will probably be uh, years that we will be in Ephesians. And uh, <laughs> as, again, if you're familiar with Ephesians, it is very thick. Uh, it's not long, but it is thick. Um, so it will be some time. And I just want to encourage you, as we do embark on this, um, this, uh, this time to uh, just understand uh, this, this so important book of the Bible, I encourage you to be uh, reading it and studying it on your own. Um, reading and studying it on your own. And then uh, we, will, we will gather, of course, on the Lord's Day, and we'll, we'll continue to uh, admonish and encourage you through this. Um, I would also consider uh, or, or recommend to you to memorize it. Memorize big chunks of this. There is, again, so much, uh, so much just writtenness, uh, richness and truth uh, that is here. Um, certainly memorizing Scripture is one of those things that I think is... Um, we don't do as much as we should have, and we don't do as much as generations have in the past. And I think there's something to be lost there. Uh, there's great value to, uh, to memorizing uh, portions of Scripture. Uh, so again, uh, today is going to feel a little strange because the, the main bulk of the sermon is just going to be uh, reading through the book of Ephesians. So it'll be uh, not too many words from me and mostly just words uh, from God. But there's, at least for me, that's kind of comforting, especially as I have a sermon that I didn't really have time to prepare for. Um, so it's, it's comforting to know that... Um, that, that the word of God is, is always true. And that that's something that uh, I can't really screw up too much, right? I don't have to add too many of, uh, of my own thoughts here. All right. Um, so typically we will stand to read God's word um, just because of uh, what we're doing today kind of uniquely. Um, you can go ahead and stay seated. But after I read our passage, um, you'll hear me affirm uh, the statement, this is the word of the Lord. Um, and at which point I encourage you to respond with, Thanks be to God. Hear now the word of the living God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above every rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us, In Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to one spirit in the Father. 
So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of all the household of God, built on the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone that was the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God." Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high and led a host of captives, he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does that mean but, the, but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning by crafty, deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him 
who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, this I say and testify to the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become calloused and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and you were taught of him, as is the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetousness, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes down upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of such things that they do in secret. But when everything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then at how you walk, not as unwise but wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another as out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands, even as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of his church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to everything, in everything, to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, 
so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation that the sword and the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with prayer, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And as also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So then, you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, I thank you for this, uh, this beautiful message. Lord, it is, it is such a gift to have, uh, to have your word and um, to have your spirit. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just continue to apply this to us, continue to make this, uh, make this clear to us, continue to glorify yourself through your word and through us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'll have a few closing words here, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up this morning. But uh, as we think about this, what, um, 
What sort of a letter is this? What sort of a letter is Ephesians? Um, it, it's certainly something that is, that is broadly written. Uh, that is, it's written, obviously, to a specific people at a specific place at a specific time, but there's certainly, Paul is very broad in the scope of that. Uh, any Christian anywhere from any time in any location can, uh, can read this, and it, and it certainly applies to them. If you think about what we, uh, what we refer to as the, uh, the, the transmission of Scripture, that is just sort of how did this, how did this pass on? Uh, again, and kind of as I, as I alluded to earlier, Paul, uh, Paul wrote this letter and uh, distributed, it, distributed it through a certain person who he mentioned there at the end. Uh, Tychicus would have been his messenger. Uh, Paul, when he wrote this letter, would have been under house arrest. Uh, Paul, if you're familiar with his life, um, spent really most of his Christian life in chains. Uh, in one way or another, and um, it, it was really from, uh, from prison that he wrote uh, so much of the New Testament. Uh, but, but Paul would have passed this on, and uh, the church would have been very eager and very diligent to, uh, to spread this message on. Um, what we refer to as the transmission of Scripture would have been, as soon as the church would have gotten this, there would have been people making copies and, um, and, and writing this down and dispersing it to other churches and other regions. Um, and uh, this, is, this is one of the big reasons why the Bible is so well attested. It's, it's by far the most attested uh, ancient, ancient book. There's really no, uh, no real close second. But, um, and part of that was just because there was a free transmission of it. That is, uh, people would just see the, see the letter and let's, let's go ahead and make a copy and let's give this on to someone. It's, we, need to, we need to pass on the word of the Lord. We need to, uh, we need to spread this. Um, and that's something that, uh, that really just uh, really helps with its, with its trustworthiness. It's, it helps with, uh, it, with, with it being well attested, with us knowing what was, uh, what was contained and, and written in this letter. Um, it's also very good in, in keeping with, with other New Testament letters. That is, when we, when we look at these books, uh, we look for similarities. Um, and, and we can look for similarities in, in Paul writing in, in different circumstances to different churches. There's a lot of parallels between uh, the book of Ephesians and also the book of uh, Colossians in particular. Um, they're structured very similar. They have very similar messages, um, very much sharing the same truth, but sort of maybe here's a little bit of a different application to a different church, to a different, uh, a different people group. Um, there's also similarities with, with Galatians and Romans and, and a number of these, um, but, uh, but Colossians is especially, especially close to it. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's in good keeping with these, with these other books, very similar themes, similar structure, um, that sort of thing. And that can help us too, just as we are students of Scripture, because there may be some places where, um, in particular, Paul might say uh, something, and he kind of mentions an offhand sentence about it in Ephesians, but then we can flip over to Colossians and say, oh, well, he wrote a whole paragraph on that topic here. So we can, we can kind of use the one to inform the other. And that's uh, very much uh, a method that we'll use as we, as we study and dive into um, to this, this book here. Uh, but really, Ephesians is one of the high points of the whole New Testament. Um, it's, it's not a very long letter. It's not nearly as long as, um, for example, Romans, but, uh, but every sentence, every phrase uh, of this is, is just carrying great, uh, great depths. Um, it's, and it, it acts in so many ways as a commentary on the rest of the Bible. Through Ephesians, through this lens of Ephesians, Paul uh, mentions a number of times a mystery being revealed. He talks about the mystery of the church. Um, that was something that as we look through the Old Testament, when we look at the Old Testament through the lens of Ephesians, we can see how God is building his church, um, really going back all the way to, uh, to Genesis, going back all the way to Adam and, and through Abraham. We see God at work in building this church made up of a people of, of all tongues and all tribes from, from all time. But this was a mystery. If you're reading just the Old Testament, you know, kind of going cover to cover, uh, starting in Genesis, it's kind of easy to overlook that. Um, this was a mystery. It's sort of, it's veiled. It's, it's shadowy. You can, uh, as you look back, you can see, oh, there it is. Uh, but if you were just reading, you know, again, cover to cover, it would be very easy to miss some of these. And, and as Paul says, this is something that's been revealed now. Uh, now we can understand all this that was, that was written prior. Um, so this is very much a, a high point of, uh, of Christian theology and Christian understanding. Um, through, this, through this high point, it, it functions as a lens uh, by which we can rightly understand um, the rest, of, the rest of the Word of God. Um, and again, it's just, it's incredibly deep. It's, uh, I imagine there will be weeks when we don't get through more than one verse at a time, uh, just going through it, just because, again, it's so, uh, it's so loaded. 
Um, the other thing, as I, as I mentioned here, is that Paul wrote this while he was imprisoned. And I think it's important for us to, to look back at um, sort of Paul's mood uh, in writing not writing the letter under great circumstances. Paul is very aware that he is suffering in life, um, that things are, things are very difficult. If you, if you remember Paul's story, prior to Christ, he was a very uh, respected um, Pharisee. He was uh, someone worthy of a lot of respect. He had accomplished a lot of things. People really looked up to him. He probably had a pretty good life uh, until he met Christ. Um, and as soon as he met Christ, everything changed. Now all the people who were looking up to him were trying to kill him. He was bouncing back and forth between uh, this prison and that. And um, he, he's not writing here in the, the worst circumstances he's been. And he's at least under house arrest here. But still, house arrest is probably not anything that, uh, that any of us would want to voluntarily sign up for, at least. So it's important to think of as we, uh, as we hear these words, knowing where Paul is coming from. The second thing, and, and this is just, I think, incredibly important as we look at the context of, uh, of this, this book uh, as a whole, is what was going on in Ephesus at the time. This is a church that had sprung up in this city, uh, in Ephesus, that's in, uh, in Asia Minor. Um, this is one of, the, um, yeah, one, one of the very important cities uh, in the ancient world. Uh, Ephesus was uh, maybe most notably uh, home to the Temple of Diana. The Temple of Diana. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, there was a massive structure there with 127 white marble columns, each one 62 feet high. Um, a place purported to be where Diana fell from heaven to, heaven to earth. A towering temple that people in Asia would uh, people would travel from all over the world to come and worship uh, at the feet of this um, this multiple-breasted, crowned goddess of fertility. This this pagan deity. Uh, this is sort of the hub and the center of life in Ephesus. Ephesus is a, is at a very uh, very strategic spot for, for trade and, and things like that. That would have been where a lot of the economy came, but it was something where really the city was uh, focused on. It was built around this pagan temple. Um, so so this, is, this is where the church is, um, is, is coming up there, and uh, that is really important to note because as we, as we think about some of the things um, that, that would have been true in the Ephesian mind, in the Ephesian culture, um, there's a number of those things that Paul is, I think, writing to repudiate. He is writing to attack uh, many of these things. Um, several examples here is that I think it's, uh, it's, it's evident in Paul's writing here that Diana's crown is false. Uh, that is, there is only one true king who wears the crown. Uh, we see that throughout this book, that Christ is the king. Christ is the king. He is the one true king. Diana's promise of fertility is also false. There is only one God who blesses us unto a thousand generations. Uh, and we see that here, here in Ephesians. Again, this is not something that is unique to Ephesians, uh, but it is certainly something that Paul is going to strongly emphasize uh, as, we, as we go through this. Um, there's only one God who blesses to a thousand generations. Uh, Diana's temple is false. Again, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This would have been a very, a very impressive uh, man-made thing. But there's only one true temple, and the true temple is the gathered people of the living God, the gathered people who call on Christ as Lord. That is the true temple. That is God knitting together his people. Again, a people of every tongue, every tribe, every age. God is knitting us together. That is the true temple. Diana's title as the one who nurtures Ephesus is false. Paul points out that it is Christ who nurtures his bride, the church. It is Christ who is building her and sustaining her and purifying her. In short, the false gods of this world, um, forces of darkness and, and powers that, that rebel, which again, Paul speaks of in this letter, particularly at the end, talking about these, uh, these cosmic powers. Um, these things are, are, are a, false, uh, a false knockoff of the true and living God. Uh, none of these compare to the, uh, the glory of God, to the power of God, to the risen and ascended and enthroned Christ. And I pray as we walk through Ephesians that you would be strengthened um, by just seeing a glimpse of the might, the power, the love, the beauty, uh, the grace of our powerful 
and sovereign king. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Well, Father, I thank you so much for uh, the church that you have been uh, so faithfully building for such a very long time. Lord, I thank you so much that we have the, uh, the joy and the privilege and the honor of, uh, of being part of your temple. Um, Lord, I pray that, uh, that this, this study, as we, as we dive into um, just such a rich and beautiful passage, Lord, I pray that this would be edifying to us all, Lord, um, that this would uh, just help us think more clearly, more rightly about who you are, about what, uh, what you've done, um, and uh, what, what you're doing through us, and, and in light of that, how you have called us to live. Um, Lord, I pray that you would just be honored, that you would be glorified, um, and that you would just continue to pour out your grace upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.